My name is Joe Peters. I run the Colorado Lawyers Chapter of the Federalist Society. Um, and it is my privilege today to introduce Chief Judge Tim Timkovich. He's the uh, Chief Judge of the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, we have sort of a running joke in Denver uh, that if you're at a, a Federalist Society event anywhere in the state of Colorado and you are not a former Timkovich clerk or intern or law partner or other colleague, the odds are pretty good you're outnumbered. Right? Um, he's a graduate of Colorado College, it's actually my alma mater as well, uh, and then he went to the University of Colorado Law School in 1982. Uh, he clerked for Chief Justice William Erickson on the Colorado Supreme Court, who's something of a legend in the state of Colorado. Um, uh, Judge Timkovich went into private practice after that for about eight years, then he became the Solicitor General of the state of Colorado under Attorney General Gail Norton, another legendary name back home. Um, as uh, Solicitor General, most famously, he argued Rummer v. Evans in the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, after about four years, he left and started his own law firm and promptly stole all of the interesting legal work away from all of the other conservative lawyers in the state of Colorado. Um, in 2003, President Bush intervened and, and restored some semblance of market balance uh, by appointing Judge Timkovich to the Tenth Circuit. Uh, here we are about 15 years later. Uh, he's the chief judge and his law clerks have gone on to become uh, the fixtures who point to him as the legend in, in the Colorado legal community. Um, Judge Timkovich's clerks are running the appellate division of our U.S. Attorney's Office. Um, they have been the Solicitor General, one clerk or another, of the state of Colorado for 12 or 13 years now. Um, they've been general counsel for presidential campaigns, uh, and uh, one of them is currently pending Senate confirmation of the U.S. District Court in the District of Colorado. Um, hopefully, uh, Judge Domenico will be the first of many former Timkovich clerks to get Article III judgeships. Um, and with that, Judge Timkovich. Thank you, Joe. Um, he told me that uh, he and I are the only two Coloradans here today, so um, I guess we consider that a, a fair fight. Um, although with all, the, with all the Californians that are moving to Denver these days to partake of our uh, high mountain atmosphere, it seems like it's uh, <laughs> California East these days. Um, well, we have a great panel, and I can't tell you how excited I am to be sitting up here with two current solicitor generals. So um, I just have to say, you know, no offense to the other panelists, <laughs> but uh, I've got a, a soft spot in my, in my uh, heart for uh, state solicitor generals. Um, our first speaker this afternoon is Joseph Tartakovsky. He's the Deputy Solicitor General for the state of Nevada. He's an alumnus of Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher, and a former James Wilson Fellow in Constitutional Law at the Claremont Institute. After earning his JD at Fordham University, he clerked for my colleague, Judge uh, Paul Kelly, uh, on the Tenth Circuit in, in uh, Santa Fe, and he is uh, a recent author. He has a book coming out later this year entitled the Lives of the Constitution, 10 Exceptional Minds That Shaped America's Supreme Law. So welcome, Joe. Our next speaker is Steve Simpson. He joins us from the Ayn Rand Institute, where as Director of Legal Studies, he writes and speaks on a variety of legal topics, including freedom of speech. A graduate of the NYU Law School and former senior attorney at the Institute for Justice, Mr. Simpson has litigated constitutional cases in state and federal courts throughout the country including the U.S. Supreme Court, and as he mentioned, uh, speechnow.org, a seminal uh, election law class uh, case. He's also published pieces in the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Legal Times, Chicago Tribune, and Slate. Um, as I said, he uh, uh, brings to us a wealth of knowledge in litigating First Amendment issues. Our next speaker is Dominant Dre. Is the he's the Solicitor General of Arizona, representing the state in a range of cases, including um, several ongoing matters we expect to hear a little bit about today. Mr. Dre graduated from the University of Pennsylvania Law School and clerked for Judge Edith Jones on the Fifth Circuit. Before becoming Arizona's Solicitor General, he practiced in the Washington, D.C. office of Kirkland and Ellis. Finally, we have Thane Rosenbaum. Uh, professor Rosenbaum is a novelist, essayist, and law professor who frequently appears in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, LA Times, Washington Post, et cetera, et cetera. He is a distinguished fellow at New York University School of Law, where he directs the Forum on Law, Culture, and Society. Professor Rosenbaum also has a book coming out this year, which I hope you talk about this afternoon, because I wanted to read it, but um, we'll have to wait for that. His new book is entitled The High Cost of Free Speech, Rethinking 
the First Amendment. Well, as a Tenth Circuit judge, believe it or not, I've had the opportunity to sit on a number of free speech cases. Um, one I had several years ago, the law clerk that helped me on that case will never forget, but it involved whether um, the federal government could be forced to, um, to reveal um, videos from a prison murder down in Colorado Supermax prison. Um, the FOIA request had been denied by the federal government on the grounds that the graphic video um, contained too much violent images and was not um, really suitable to a First Amendment dissemination. Um, our court upheld that uh, restriction um, on the dissemination, basically um, relying on the privacy rights of the, of the victim's family. Uh, another case I was involved was, was mentioned this morning, and that uh, uh, is um, Stranloff versus um, the United States, and that was uh, the Tenth Circuit version of a challenge to the Stolen Valor Act. And one of the speakers this morning touched on that. The Alvarez case was the case that went to the Supreme Court. Um, I, alas, had upheld the constitutionality, or our panel had, of the Stolen Valor Act, but the Supreme Court uh, knocked that down um, in a decision by Justice uh, Kennedy. And more, uh, most recently, and maybe the panelists can touch on that, um, our circuit had a, uh, he heard a challenge uh, to a case that, um, that took on uh, an ordinance in Fort Collins, Colorado, that banned um, topless um, uh, being a topless person in public. And um, there was a First Amendment and equal protection challenge to that ordinance. Um, the district court in Colorado struck down that ordinance as a violation of the equal protection clause. The other primary argument that the plaintiffs had was that they had a free, uh, free speech right to expressive conduct. My point is that about every controversial act of government begets its contra uh, contravailing right to speech is burning your draft card speech? What about burning a flag? Or baking a cake, as we've heard, making pornography, or walking topless in public? And how do we square the right to speech with other important rights? Is it stronger that the right to be free from threats or fear of harm? What about the right to truth? What about the right to equal treatment? In short, where does the right to free speech end? You know, conservatives often rail about activist judges inventing or perhaps discovering new freedoms in the Constitution through substantive due process. But we may be ignoring an equally questionable tendency among our ranks to relentlessly expand the meaning of speech and constitutionalize other areas of life and law. So today, we will hopefully take a step back and ask, have we gone too far? To get us started, Solicitor General. Thank you, Judge Timkovich. It's great to be here with you, especially as a, a pioneer of the Solicitor General work that I now do. It's nice to be here with my fellow panelists, and it's nice to be here with all of you. Everybody hanging in there? <laughs> all right. Well, I have, a, I have a simple proposition, which is that when it comes to the free speech clause and all the conduct that occurs under it, we have, we have come to treat the free speech clause as somehow touched by the sacred, no matter how vicious or ugly the speech, no matter what form it takes, and no matter how distant it is from the purposes, the original purposes of the First Amendment. So let, it, let us just stipulate that our approach is very different from that of the founders. Thomas Jefferson in 1803 became, I, I would submit, the, the original proponent of the doctrine of fake news. He was so infuriated by the Federalist opposition press, was so infuriated by their lying, that's his word, he instigated a series of uh, prosecutions for seditious libel among the states. We don't do seditious libel anymore, as, as more recent proponents of fake news are finding out. How many of you out there have done a, an obscenity case? One, two, great, criminal obscenity. Good. How many of you have done a blasphemy case? <laughs> those, are, those are two crimes that the founders thought were important to society to prosecute, but which we have essentially declared unconstitutional. Now, let me say, I think this is a good thing. I think we have a, a, a more complete understanding of the principle of free speech today. It took us a while to get there. The low point was probably around the time of the First World War, when we were still 
raiding theaters for excessively long kisses or passing laws like the one I actually saw in Nevada the other day that makes it a crime to speak evilly of the flag. What I'm, uh, what I'm suggesting, however, is that we've lurched too far in the opposite direction towards what I'm calling free speech absolutism. And I'll, I'll tell you what I mean, but let me quickly just say what I'm not talking about. We, we must always remain on guard against the tendency of those in power to suppress unpopular or opposition speech. Nothing I'm saying is in support of campus speech codes or in derogation of uh, a Citizens United. What, what I am talking about is this. Let me get my clicker here. This, this, this is the Supreme Court's uh, most recent and one of its most purest statements of the doctrine of free speech absolutism. Government has no power to restrict expression because of its message, its ideas, its subject matter, or its content. Focus, ladies and gentlemen, on those words, no power. What do you mean, no power? Under the guise of free speech, I can, I can uh, publish the plant, the, the, the scheme of a nuclear power plant. I can release sensitive medical information. Can I give legal advice to ISIS? No, the truth is we restrict speech all the time when we believe that there's some countervailing interest that outweighs the supposed value of the speech. This form of absolutism, like I think most absolutisms, is not even true. It's rhetoric that outpaces our reality and it has uh, real world effects for, this, uh, for those of us on the ground. This no power line was at the heart of a decision by a federal district court in Virginia last summer when the court said that the city of Charlottesville had no power to move the Unite the Right rally, which, as we all know, uh, ended so tragically in the death of one woman and the injury of scores of others, and it was a miracle that it wasn't worse. The city had given a permit for a 400-person uh, rally. When the city learned that it was going to be closer to 4,000, many of them spoiling for a fight, all congregating in this one-acre area, they tried to move it to a larger park where they thought they'd be better able to keep the sides separate. Court let, didn't let them do it, said there was no evidence that this was going to get out of hand. What happened was exactly what the city had warned was going to happen. Turns out that most of the, mo the, mo the most important free speech cases do not actually involve uh, uh, courts rebuking petty officials for supposedly suppressing speech. They involve the Supreme Court striking down statutes. Take uh, Brown versus Entertainment Merchants Association. Um, a few years ago, California passed a law that said that if you are a minor and you want to buy a, a violent video game, you have to get your parental consent, just like buying uh, cigarettes or pornography. The Supreme Court Justice Scalia writing said that violent video games were essentially the, the pixelated equivalent of violent books, which could include a, a, a Dante or a Homer. Now, we should be so lucky. Homer and Dante have some, some gruesome passages, but they are surrounded by a few thousand lines of immortal poetry. And more to the point, how did the court know that the effect on a developing mind of reading about violent or gruesome things is the same as viewing them, let alone interactively clicking them into existence hour after hour? And yes, the California had no power to do it. Justice Alito, in a, in a concurrence that was essentially a dissent, said that the court was conflating, making a facile uh, analogy between what it knows books and what it doesn't know, um, violent video games. This is how absolutism disarms democracy from dealing with real harms. That's the first problem. Here's a second problem. Free speech absolutism expands the doctrine of free speech into non-speech realms. One of the complexities of the speech clause is it protects not just speech, but, but expressive conduct, so not just words, but gestures. At some level, any form of human conduct can be characterized as expressive activity. So in 1993, a, a group of people called natural gardeners, these are people who believe that the, the best garden is an untended one, brought a challenge to uh, Chicago's weed ordinance 
which is a law that says don't let your plants grow above a certain height. They said gardening is free expression. Seventh Circuit said, yeah, right. <laughs> Seventh Circuit may need to revisit that in the near future because just in December, the Supreme Court heard Masterpiece Cake Shop, in which a, a baker took the position that when he produces a cake with sufficient artistry, when he's essentially painting on an edible canvas, that can be free expression. And the court said, well, what about the florist who does the arrangement for the wedding? The baker said, yeah, her too. So maybe we're, we're establishing the principle that the arrangement of plant matter can be free expression. And these natural gardeners actually haven't given up. They keep bringing these challenges. One day they may win. And when they do, it will, not, it will be not because you have a property right in your personal foliage. It will be because gardening is free expression. What's the solution to all this? I think it's to, it's to abandon the rhetoric, and in particular to give greater deference to the reasons that legislatures have for restricting expressive conduct. These reasons are almost never related to the suppression of ideas. They have to do with things like protecting children, uh, public safety, something, sometimes even something as quaint as a public uh, morality or order. The, the great proponent of this view has been Samuel Alito in the Reed case, uh, in the Brown case, in the uh, Alvarez, the Stolen Ballarat case, Westboro Baptist, the Snyder case. Uh, he will sometimes agree with the court that the law is too broad. It has a vagueness problem, um, captures too much legitimate speech. But his plea will be to, to stop with the extravagant sloganeering that is preventing legislatures from going back to the drawing board, from producing version 2.0 of these laws, which by narrowing the problem, narrowing the law in some way, which by the way, is always how we've gotten to our First Amendment compliant laws. So just last year in a case called Packingham, North Carolina had passed a law that said that um, uh, sex offenders, people who've committed sex crimes against minors basically can't go on social media. The problem they're trying to get at is that something more than a third of uh, sexual assaults are facilitated in some way or another by social media. You can track kids, for instance. Um, the court realized, I think rightly, this was a very harsh law. That This was like saying that you can't buy a newspaper. You can't speak in a park. I mean, internet is like, a, is like water or air conditioning. I mean, it's, a, it's a necessity. Justice Alito said, oh, I get that. I agree with that much. But the court's loose rhetoric, and that was his, his word, loose rhetoric, was going to prevent North Carolina from trying again. Um, once again, he warned that the court was making a, a facile analogy between, what it, between, in this case, real space and cyberspace. Cyberspace, for, just for instance, allows um, intimate and anonymous approaches to children in a way that would be impossible in, say, a playground. If we are going to decide cases by, by rhetoric, and maybe that's just inevitable in this area, let's at least have, have the right rhetoric. And that would be Justice Jackson in the flag sloop, the Barnett case. No official, high or petty, can be prescribed what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion or force people. <clears throat> now doesn't that, this is, this is the most unimprovable statement, I think, of what the First Amendment ought to mean. Doesn't it clarify, to some extent, how we ought to deal with gardening or cake baking? Because in the end, I think that, I guess at, at risk of blasphemy, and, and I guess that's one reason why I'm glad I can't be prosecuted for blasphemy anymore, but at risk of blasphemy, <laughs> I sometimes feel that the average city councilman has as complete an appreciation of the doctrine of free speech as did Mr. Fake News, Thomas Jefferson. And it was Jefferson, after all, who did warn, warn us to keep up a, a radical spirit of inquiry in all things. So let us not exempt the free speech clause, let alone the decisions purporting to interpret it from that spirit. Thanks so much. Well, many of us in this room were corrupted by Ayn Rand, so we're looking forward to <laughs> Steve's remarks. Thank you, Judge. Um, let me first say thanks to the Federal Society for having this event 
and this panel, I mean, free speech, I think, is one of the most important issues in the country today, perhaps the most. Uh, I do a lot of speaking to Federal Society student groups, so I am really happy that the Federal Society exists, uh, and then thanks to all of my, my fellow panel members. Um, one of the, I guess, the advantages of going second is you get to criticize the guy who went before you. The disadvantage is that you want to change your entire talk to, to refer to what uh, the person before you said. So I'm going to try to resist actually both of those things. And I don't mean to say that I'm going to criticize Joe. Um, I kind of agree with a lot of what Joe said. Um, and yet I think the framing of it is, is wrong. Um, I find myself in a kind of curious position in that, uh, as, as uh, Judge Timpovich pointed out uh, from the Ayn Rand Institute, how much more radical can you get than Ayn Rand? Total laissez-faire capitalism, unregulated, you know, government kept to a very small um, place in all of our lives. And yet, I think that there are ways in which the idea that we've gone too far with free speech is actually correct. Now, I wouldn't say that it's an issue of uh, treating free speech too much as an absolute or going too far. I just think it's an outright mistake. It's, an, it's, a, it's a mistake in understanding uh, what free speech is and what its proper scope is. The danger, of course, that if you inflate the right, people stop taking it seriously. And there are even worse consequences, I think, which, I, which I'm going to talk to, uh, talk to or, or speak to uh, a bit. But I don't think it's an issue of, as Joe, Joe put it, uh, rhetoric or uh, an issue of judges going too far. I think it's an issue of we don't really have a clear conception in this country about what the right to free speech is. We don't have a clear idea of what it means to have a right to free speech and what it covers. Very quickly, I'll just throw out my, my conception of it. You, the, the right to free speech covers your right to say whatever you want, as much as you want, but with the provision that you do so on your own property, with your own resources, you have no right to speak on someone else's property. You have no right to violate somebody else's rights with your right to free speech. Now, that's a complicated issue, um, but it gets to some of the things I think that, uh, that Joe talked about and, and others have raised, libel, fraud, that kind of thing. But we do have to have a, a concept of free speech to know how to mediate the kinds of disputes that we're seeing today, which many of them are, I think, motivated by a real opposition to freedom of speech as a cultural value and as a right. The way I often think about it is that there are tons of voices today on college campuses and throughout our society who would adopt European-style hate speech laws in a moment if they could get away with it. I think that is actually true. I hearken, to hearken back to some of the earlier panels, I think that's a real issue of education. We are not teaching young people what the value of free speech is. We are not teaching them that it is a right and how to think about rights. Now, there are lots of reasons for that, but, uh, but what I want to focus in on now is where I think we're going wrong and what the danger is. Um, so let me give you two, two categories. Uh, Joe talked about one of them already. One is treating things which aren't free speech as though they, they were free speech. And uh, Judge Timkovitz's example of, of people wandering around topless is a good example of that. Sex toys is another one. I'm, I'm as much a fan of sex toys as anybody. But <laughs> I don't think they're free speech. I mean, it's just not right to say this is free speech to sell a sex toy, or for that matter, many other commercial transactions. It's just not quite right. Uh, to say that that's free speech. I mean, in, that, in the case of, uh, of walking around topless, it doesn't convey anything. It's not right to call that free speech. Now, one of the reasons that we've done this is that, uh, is that, is that our jurisprudence in, uh, in the 20th century has cleaved rights between fundamental and non-fundamental. Free speech is a fundamental right. People have a, uh, an interest and a desire to protect their freedom in many ways, so they try to cram everything into the First Amendment. That, that's a mistake that is understandable, but I think it has real consequences. To give you a sense of, of one of those consequences, um, I don't know how many people here will remember uh, Stanley Fish. He, was a, he is a postmodernist uh, law professor. He was at Duke for many years. Wrote an article at one point called, uh, There's No Such Thing as the Right to Free Speech, and It's a Good Thing, Too. And his point was, we treat this right, or, or his, I think his substantive point was, free speech is a hollow concept. It's, it's a meaningless concept. It gets filled by whoever is in power. Now, he's wrong about that in, in an objective sense, I would say. But there's reason for us to think that when we have a jurisprudence that treats sex toys running around topless uh, as free speech, and yet, yet on the other hand is, is, is really restricting, I think, in the campaign finance area is one example, real free speech, or there are people who actually want to attack free speech, it seems arbitrary. So that's, that's one of the, the problems. Another problem is that we protect free speech 
in areas in which it has no business being protected, or we, we protect speech. So there are some uh, circumstances in which what somebody is doing really is speech, unquestionably, but it should not be protected in a certain context. Let me give you two examples. Um, one, I think actually both of these will probably be controversial, and maybe we can talk more about them on the panel. I think there's a real problem. I mean, first, the idea that people have the right, as a right, to speak on public property um, is a really problematic concept. It doesn't really make sense if you think about what a right actually is, which is an entitlement to action just by virtue of the fact that you're a human being. It can't be that we have the right to speak on pro public property whenever we want, to say nothing of the right to march, the right to have clashing protests. All of this leads to an example that, that Joe gave, which is Charlottesville. Uh, if people really see that, uh, that there's, an, in effect, a right to invade my space or my place with uh, your marches, with your protests, that somehow an actual, I mean, I regard what happened in, in Charlottesville as tantamount to a gang war. That if that is an example of free speech, if people, you know, fighting on public property with one civilian and two police officers dying, if that's what free speech looks like, I think a lot of people are gonna say, to hell with that, I don't support it. Now, the mistake is not that they're against free speech. The mistake is how we're conceptualizing uh, uh, the, the right. It's, it's problematic to say that we have a right, meaning you can, you can t speak or, 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 or uh, protest or march on public property without any real restraints. Now, I mean, we can talk about what some of the restraints should be, but I do agree that uh, in something like a Charlottesville situation, the courts have to have much more leeway to at least impose time, place, and manner restrictions on the speakers, to, to relegate them to places, to keep them entirely apart. The idea that we blame the police for something uh, like Charlottesville, I think is, is really, I think it's abhorrent. It's not the police's job to referee uh, what amount to gang wars. We just can't have that. that and, and considering that as free speech is, is very problematic. And I think that leads to a lot of what we're seeing on college campuses today, which is the conflation of speech with a threat. If you actually think that somebody has the right to come on your campus to, uh, to march, uh, to uh, you know, advocate violence, to doing a lot of the kinds of things that we've seen, and you conflate that with free speech, it's natural for at least a young person to say, yeah, this really is a, a threat to my welfare. Now, there's much more going on there uh, on, the, on the panel uh, uh, earlier on speech on campus. I think many good points were made that there's a whole philosophical context to why students are so easily offended today. But uh, even with that, what we don't want to do with our jurisprudence, what we don't want to do with our uh, discussions of free speech is suggest that uh, or, or give them, you know, add fuel to the fire, give them reason to really think, yeah, my rights are actually threatened when other people want to speak. Um, now, college campuses are an enormously complicated uh, area. Um, I do think they have to have um, a, a fair amount of leeway. I mean, certainly a public college campus, I think, has to have total leeway to decide who speaks and who doesn't. Public universities are, I think, an intractable problem. I don't think there is a simple solution to that because making a public university public or making a university public naturally puts people at odds with one another. You have taxpayer interests, you have students, you have faculty, you have politicians. There's no way to, to, to reconcile uh, these kinds of conflicts. Um, but it, it is, there is something I would suggest very strange about the idea that uh, even a public university has to spend millions of dollars and practically close down the university so a crackpot like Richard Spencer can speak there. When that is happening, I would suggest something has gone wrong in our conception of free speech. I'm not advocating for content-based distinctions. Um, uh, uh, I mean, I think what the Reed case said is absolutely correct. Government has no power to make content-based distinctions. I would broaden it, and I'll close with this, and, and, and put it this way. When it comes to free speech, government's uh, approach, its, its approach to free speech should be totally hands off. Government and free speech should be kept totally separate. I would actually argue government and the realm of ideas have to be kept totally separate. 
That's easier to see when it's government restricting someone's free speech. We should not restrict, say, I mean, in Reed it was a church and uh, they were essentially a private uh, enterprise wanting to put directional signs up. It was every right to do that, um, in my view. Um, but the other, the other side of the coin has to be true as well. Government has to stay out of any suggestion that it is supporting speech. And, and ultimately, when it is providing public fora, when it is creating public universities and, and allowing people to speak there, which, I mean, there's no, there's no choice but to allow them to speak there, it's, it runs smack up against that problem. People see government essentially supporting speech, and they have every right to object to that. And I don't think that, uh, that the principle of content neutrality is really an ultimate solution. People are going to object to people like Richard Spencer coming to campus and the idea that you just tell them you have to live with it. It's not, uh, I don't find that to be a tenable solution. We could talk about what maybe some of the solutions are. I mean, my solution would be completely radical. It's not ever going to happen in, in our lifetime. I would privatize the universities. That's not gonna happen. But what that means is we have to grapple with a, a situation that is enormously difficult, but understand at the very least, the difficulty is caused by, in part, our conception of free speech and the fact that we have government, whether we like it or not, supporting speech in myriad ways. That has to cause problems. Thank you. Dominique. Thank you, uh, and thanks for the chance to be on this kind of sneaky afternoon panel, uh, because after hours of listening to people talk about First Amendment and speech issues, then we come along and say, free speech, have we gone too far? And you're probably predisposed <laughs> to say, yeah, we've gone a little too far. Uh, but mindful of, of the way that we've cleverly worn you down before uh, suggesting ways in which we might limit speech, uh, I have two very concrete examples uh, of speech as it's expanded in, uh, in recent decades that are uh, in the criminal realm. And I can illustrate them with cases that the state of Arizona is involved in. Um, but I will do that in a way that does not recuse a few judges in the room who I hope can <laughs> not be recused. Um, the, those growth areas in the criminal law are, uh, are kind of interesting. So the first one uh, is the discovery of a First Amendment right of access. And this is a, a concept that I think is, uh, yeah, at the very least it's a growth area in, uh, in First Amendment uh, thinking and in free speech thinking. Because as I've already said, it's a right of access. It's not a right of speech at all. And it begins in, I think the first case is a case called Miller in 1966, but it really grows in a case called Guardian News in 1982, um, in which the Supreme Court uh, takes up the issue of access to uh, certain testimony. Uh, it's actually a child victim of, of sexual abuse. Um, and the court says in, in, that, uh, in that decision that the individual citizen can effectively participate in and contribute to our Republican system of government. Well, in order to achieve that, rather, the First Amendment right of access ensures that this constitutionally protected discussion of governmental affairs is an informed one. That's an interesting way to approach the First Amendment right to speak, that the government will now say, as a First Amendment matter, that you have, or the First Amendment confers an additional right, which is that the discussion will be an informed one. That's a qualitative guarantee. It's not the, the sort of basic guarantee that you be allowed to speak, but rather that we will uh, put into the First Amendment the ability to collect information. It's the First Amendment as a discovery tool. And it's, it's gotten traction since that time. And the most, um, most notable example, uh, a gift from the Ninth Circuit, is uh, a case called California First Amendment Coalition, uh, which involved a claim of access under this, under this First Amendment right to know more so that you can then speak better, uh, involving access to executions, to view executions. And the holding in California First Amendment Coalition, which is 2002, uh, takes the Guardian News concept a bit further, and it says, well, uh, the ability to attend and witness uh, public executions is important because that contributes to the public dialogue about the death penalty, whether we want to support this uh, form of punishment or not. But it's interesting the way that the court describes the particular contribution, the qualitative contribution that this makes to 
uh, to our public discourse. It says, public observation of executions foster the same sense of catharsis that public observation of criminal trials fosters. Although this may reflect the dark side of human nature, the Supreme Court has recognized that the public must be permitted to see justice done, lest it vent its frustration in extra legal ways. So now, in the interest of serving the dark side of human nature, we have this discovery tool in the First Amendment that allows people to see certain, certain amount of the execution. And in that case, it involved the time that the person was brought into the execution chamber through the time that he was declared dead. And that is sort of the, um, the beginning of, or an expansion, I should say, of the, of the previous example of the, um, uh, of the Guardian News case that has now moved uh, beyond just uh, written things but into observing an act as part of your speech rights. Um, and now it, it actually proposes to move further. And this brings us to the Arizona case. Um, we have two cases. One is called the First Amendment Coalition, which I think is the same guys. And another one is called, uh, I forget, it's, it's the Guardian newspaper again. But um, they have sued seeking a variety of additional information uh, concerning executions. So things like the quality and potency of drugs, the source of those drugs, the uh, identifying traits about the qualifications of people who administer capital sentences, um, as well as audio uh, access to the death chamber. And again, the, the sort of theory is that this allows them to speak more um, completely about capital punishment but what it has become is, frankly, a discovery tool that really complicates the work of the state. I mean, if you want to say things like capital punishment is terrible and, and here's what I observed because, uh, because the previous California First Amendment coalition case allowed us to witness this execution, that's one thing. But now we have access, or this is the, this is the request, um, and I'm happy to say that we're um, uh, appellees uh, in both of these cases. But one never knows. Uh, maybe I'll soon be petitioner in both of these cases in the next uh, setting. But it's, uh, it, it's, it's a real obstacle to carrying out capital sentences for the state if people's identities can be figured out uh, by the, the type of qualifications that they have. And the qualifications that they seek involve some like hospital-specific information that would make it pretty clear. If you, if you were intent on figuring it out, and believe me, the anti-capital punishment crowd is pretty intent, uh, you could sort out who these folks are, and you could sort out who the suppliers of the drugs are, and that would, that would effectively prohibit the state from, uh, from carrying out capital sentences. And again, note what's causing that. It's not that you wrote such a compelling article that you turned public opinion against us. It's that you've used this First Amendment right of access in order to wage what Justice Alito called the guerrilla war on capital punishment. And that's an important change, I think, in, in First Amendment uh, jurisprudence, that it has shifted from just protecting people who want to write the damning article. The, frankly, these people could get access to the, the information about drug suppliers and execution team members and shut down through intimidation, private, you know, targeted intimidation, uh, a state's ability to carry out capital sentences without ever publishing an article in their newspapers. So it's not about public speech at all. It's now a discovery tool, or it threatens to become a discovery tool. The second case that I'll touch on, which is also in, uh, in the criminal law context, is Arizona Attorneys for Criminal Justice against Brnovich. Okay, so one of the named parties is the guy who pays me, uh, so you can guess where I am on this one, but uh, the Attorney General, <laughs> Mark Brnovich, has been sued um, by a group of criminal defense lawyers who, uh, who are challenging an actually decades-old statute in Arizona that prohibits direct contact with victims by either um, criminal defendants or their lawyers. And, of course, that makes it sort of hard to intimidate witnesses uh, so they would like to have direct access to those uh, victims. And the plaintiffs, so the plaintiffs are a group of, of attorneys. It's no, no named plaintiff is, a, is himself the defendant who seeks to communicate directly. Well, for one thing, he's probably incarcerated, and so getting direct contact is not exactly something that he can um, pull off anyway. But, uh, but it's a group of attorneys. Uh, and this implicates the sort of extremely limited speech rights that attorneys have uh, as agents of their clients and also as officers of the court. 
I mean, you're not allowed to just go into court and say absolutely anything. You all know that. And the, court, the Supreme Court, that is, has uh, upheld that restriction in the past, but has sort of allowed things here and there. And you have the Gentile case from the uh, United States Supreme Court that allows speaking on the courthouse steps. Um, and now what remains to be determined in, in this case, which is still in the uh, trial court, and my capable colleague O.H. Skinner is uh, briefing it, uh, it, now what you have is a question about what attorneys can say in, in court, in their capacity as an advocate. Does their capacity as an advocate allow them a right of access so that they can speak to victims directly rather than, as the law currently requires, they have to contact the state and then the state in turn communicates with the victim to ask if they want to waive their right to not be bothered. Um, and they, they, of course, would like to go directly. So. Uh, there, are, there are very few circumstances when a defendant, a criminal defendant, is able to make a discovery demand. The only real example I could think of was something about like exculpatory evidence under Brady maybe is kind of like a discovery demand by a criminal defendant. But this would be a, a change. This, this, this lawsuit in the name of free speech would be effectively uh, a discovery tool for criminal defendants so that they could speak to the people who are their victims or their alleged victims. And that would be, uh, I think, a rather significant shift in, um, in the scope of, of the First Amendment. So there, there are my two answers to the question uh, about how we, have we gone too far. I think in the area of criminal law, uh, there are some ways to question whether we've moved beyond speech entirely. And I would think that one of the solutions uh, is to get back to a concept uh, of, the, of the speech clause protecting you know, speech. And that's probably consistent with some of the distinctions that uh, Steve was just drawing about uh, actions versus speech. Um, I think that speech versus discovery so that you might engage in speech is another way that we could sort of look out for this absolutism. Thanks. That might Thanks. be th three yeses to the question presented. So let's hear from Professor Rosenbaum now. Hello, everyone. Uh, sit here or go to the podium? Joe had already created a precedent. Does anyone have a view? <laughs> podium? All right, I'll try that. What, what Joe neglected to tell you is I was his former professor in law school. Uh, I think he didn't tell you because he was embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> but it does demonstrate that we stand up. <laughs> Just saying, we have a style that I taught him, <laughs> and where would he be without that? <laughs> I'm always amazed that I get invited to things like this, and so thank you, uh, Federalist Society. I'm truly honored to be here. Uh, I mean amazed because I'm, I've been so critical of the premises of the First Amendment for so long, and I have this new book out that's going to be hammered by everybody, uh, that I wonder why would anyone invite me uh, to, to speak here. Uh, Mike McConnell, I think, just went to the bathroom. I saw him leave. Uh, <laughs> but he, he, he invited me to a Stanford conference a few years ago, and so I just want to make a disclaimer. He'll come out of the bathroom. He'll be surprised to hear me talking about him. Uh, he, he, I think he invited me because he thought it was a First Amendment conference at Stanford that I would be defending trigger warnings and uh, microaggressions and safe spaces. Let me just say what I said then, and he was surprised. I thought he thought he was disappointed to hear. I'm opposed to all of that, all right? So I'm opposed to microaggressions, safe spaces, campus speech codes. I actually also think that uh, uh, the Muhammad cartoons are fair game. I think that no religion has the right to impose its sensitivities or the tenets of its religion on other people. And the ideas behind a religion are fair game, just like the ideas behind communism is fair game. I use this analogy all the time. If a, if a student came from a, a long line of communists and showed up to a class in European history and the professor was talking about the, the deficiencies of communism, what happened if the student went to the dean of students and said, I can't believe how hurtful that was. I come from a family of communists, and he was very critical, and I feel unsafe. In, not in the history department, everywhere here, because you criticized 
the, the tenets, the ideas of, of ideology. So, so just to give you a disclaimer, although I probably will infuriate many of you, those things are not things that I'm opposed to, although I will say that I, <laughs> at lunch I sat with Judge uh, Ikuta, is that how she's pronounced? And she just said, well, tell me a little about what you were about to say. And she and her family just left. I just want you to know. <laughs> So if you had any thoughts of talking to her later, this is just totally me. I sat with her, I spoke to her two minutes, she was out. So, uh, look, I'm, what I'm really opposed to is, Mike, I was talking about you. As, uh, it was all favorable. Um, I, I am talking specifically about a kind of, what I would call an, an American pathology, which is this idea of First Amendment absolutism. Because absolutism is a word, it's not even a good word, right? In every other ca aspect of our lives, we would be offended by, what do you mean absolute, everything? Absolutism, right? It's, it sounds like zealots, lunatics speak like this. Uh, we act with a level of sort of moral superiority. Look at us, we believe in the First Amendment beyond you know, reason. Uh, it's our self-definition. We're told that it makes us a better society to be this way. It's the hallmark of democracy, we're told. In fact, we're told it's essential to democracy. Well, you know, I, I have news for you. It's not true. Uh, Europe, every European country, uh, there are also democracies throughout the Western Europe. They also, many of them, have free speech clauses. And none of them know what this nonsense of absolutism does not exist anywhere but in the United States, only here. Uh, in Germany, if you engage in Holocaust denial, you next day you just go to prison. Uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, in Brazil, you just go to prison. Uh, in France, in France, uh, they have a comic. Uh, his name is Mbala Mbala de Doudenay. Does anyone know him? He's like Lenny Bruce on crack. Uh, uh, and his act is he gets up there and he talks about Jews in France and he says, uh, you know, wouldn't it be great if we just gas them? And then he goes to jail, right? He just, it's not clear. And he spends, he spent, you know, Belgium, Germany, he's been jailed, he's been paying fines. That's his act. Um, uh, they, the Europeans look at us and they see the cross burnings, uh, the disruptions of military funerals, and the, 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 you know, truly families in grief, you know, trying to bury their son for the last time. And we have a Supreme Court that voted eight to one that that's okay. You know, there's no even disagreement. Of course, of course, the Westboro Baptist Church has rights that are, supersede the rights of a family to bury their son. Of course. Uh, they see uh, Nazis marching through Skokie and they just think we're nuts. You know, they just think, Why, what, what makes you so superior? We too are democratic societies. And let me tell you something, we're not even intellectually honest about this, because we actually don't agree with this anyway. We just say it, but in our hearts, we don't agree with absolutism. And it's not just because, uh, you know, we know some of the, my fellow panelists have already pointed out, I mean, you know, free speech, there, it's beyond not being able to shout fire in a crowded theater. But uh, you, can't, you can't shout fire in a crowded courtroom. Right. By the way, you can't get up, there's some judges in this room, you can't get up in the courtroom and just start screaming. Right? Judges will say you're out of order, they'll throw you out. And you know why? It's called civility and decorum. You don't have the right to just stand up and speak whenever you want. Uh, you don't even have the right to commit perjury. You don't have the right to lie. Uh, you don't have a right to uh, engage in any true threats or intimidation. But even outside the operation of the, fourth, uh, of the First Amendment, when you're not dealing with government regulation or censorship, if everyone really believed in free speech, and by the way, this is a problem with Americans that we, they didn't do well when they studied physics. You know, you hear people all the time, they don't understand how the Constitution works. They don't understand it says, the government shall not abridge for a free speech. So people say all the time, oh really, I have a free speech right to speak freely, right? I can say whatever I want to you. You know, this idea that it's part of our culture, that we believe I can say anything I want to you. And they don't think about it. They think it's a First Amendment right, even though it's not involving government intervention. But we've talked about, you know, campus speech codes. These are examples in which people demonstrate their, in, their intolerance for all kinds of speech. Uh, 
in Irvine, uh, the, uh, 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 the, we have shouting down. We had the president of the Israel's ambassador uh, to the United Nations, uh, to America, the United States was shouted down. Uh, liberal universities has come up several times. They are, are terribly illiberal nowadays, and it's really embarrassing. They used to be safe havens for open and robust debate, and now they censor speech more than really any you know dictator or mullah uh, ever does. You know, it really has that level of tyranny. Um, but there are other examples. Uh, someone I think mentioned earlier about the uh, oh, it was Judge Brea, uh, the Mozilla CEO who gave a thousand dollar check uh, because he was opposed to Prop 8 uh, and uh, he wound up losing his job. There was a Google engineer. I mean, this, I'm just saying, if you really believe in the First Amendment, then how does this happen? There was a Google engineer who just lost his job. He wrote an internal memo to the Google team just raising an idea. Here's the idea that there are actually some biological differences between men and women, and that's one of the reasons why there are more women engin men engineers than female engineers. I mean, it might be a politically incorrect thing to say. It may be demonstrably wrong, but he was fired. He was done. Um, uh, Colin Kaepernick doesn't seem to have a First Amendment right to speak uh, in the way he wants to speak. You know, he's been morally censured, uh, has no job. Uh, Donald Sterling was my favorite. People forgot this guy. This guy who used to own the LA Clippers, right? I mean, I, does anyone remember this one? Is I know it sounds it's pretty just deplorable, except that, you know, the guy it was his mistress. He was he. <laughs> he this is a woman. He's, he bought her a Ferrari. He bought her a condominium in Los Angeles, and he didn't like the fact that she took some photos with some African American players. It made him feel weird. He was 80 years older than her, also, and <laughs> he, and. He didn't feel manly when he saw the photos. And he didn't know he was being tape recorded in a private conversation. He lost his NBA franchise. They took his franchise away because he said, let me tell you something in this room. You know, in private, people say things. You know? <laughs> they actually, they stub a toe and they say terrible things. <laughs> And we usually, and everyone here knows you've stubbed your toe and you said a terrible thing. And what would happen if they started to take your stuff away? Because someone recorded you on that particular day and said, aha, we're taking it away. I, I don't think we really believe in free speech. If you can take away an NBA franchise, you don't really believe in this. Um, uh, Sigma Alpha uh, Epsilon, University of Oklahoma, uh, a few years ago was chanting racist chants and uh, they ended up being kicked off campus. They were singing a song about lynching and what, what a good idea lynching was. And they were kicked, kicked off campus. University of Oklahoma, by the way, is a state institution. It totally invokes First Amendment guarantees. Um, I don't see the difference between that and cross burning. Why the Supreme Court's been very clear, even, even up into uh, uh, Virginia versus black, but it seems to me that in that instance, people didn't say, well, you know, they have the right to sing a chant about lynching. It's despicable, and they shouldn't. But in that instance, and by the way, that, I don't even think anyone brought a case about that. Um, the last thing that's interesting was uh, about Charlottesville, because it's been mentioned. What we haven't mentioned is that you may remember the, the, the attorneys that represented the Nazis at Skokie were LC, ACLU lawyers, and the same lawyers different generation, uh, represented the alt-right movement uh, in Charlottesville. But 200 of them wrote a letter to their executive director questioning why they do this. Even the ACLU sometimes thinks this is nuts, right? It's just nuts. They're saying, why, why are we defending these clowns? You know, aren't we really interested in social justice and equality? And the fact that this didn't get much press, but 200 lawyers actually had to second guess why they do what they do, because they're focused entirely on absolutism. Can you have some water, please? Um, See if you were sitting down. Yes, there was a... <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you know that what they say about Joe and I, you know? We're... We stand up. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, the other thing quickly I want to say is absolutism overrides two serious consequences of free speech, and they have to do with dignity and harm. 
Um, the framers of our Constitution may not have put dignity, the word dignity, either in the Declaration of Independence or in the Constitution. It was, a, to me, a drafting error, a terrible drafting error, error, because, in fact, in their correspondence to each other, first of all, they were not hung up on free speech. They were hung up on freedom of the press. In fact, early on in some of the early drafts of the First Amendment, speech wasn't even in it. It was press. That's what they were focused on. The second thing is they never believed. It, this free speech nonsense starts around 1950. Uh, prior to that, you heard someone earlier say there wasn't even any First Amendment cases in the 19th century. The framers were totally interested. They said speech is important, but not at the expense of human dignity not in causing injury to another person. They all know this. Everybody knows this, except for lunatics who believe that it should be absolute in all instances. Our founding fathers and mothers didn't think of it this way. They understood that if speech causes damage to dignity, then, it, then, it, then the speech has gone too far. European constitutions, again, all have dignity in it. All of them. In fact, they have also free speech, but they have dignity because they recognize the idea of civility and mutual respect. What is the point of having citizenship if your social standing is always subject to review and to harsh treatment and contempt? And so this idea of, of understanding that absolutism is a ticket, a, a ticket, a free ticket to deprive people of dignity citizenship, social standing, um, their sense of inner worth, and, and, and peaceful tranquility. The last point has to do with harm. And when you read, if you should choose to buy my book, uh, there's a section, it, I'm not going to bore you with it here, I'll bore you with it in the book. Uh, there's a whole section on science, neuroscience. This isn't even a question anymore. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but names can never hurt me. Nice rhyme. It's stupid. It was never right. It's always wrong. It's anyone who's and was a kid knows. It's a nice rhyme, but it was always wrong. Words do harm and do hurt. We didn't even understand. The, the neuroscience on this now is overwhelming that it causes sickness. It's not even mental health problems. It actually causes physical sicknesses. It degenerates immune system. It creates inflammation throughout the body. That's in addition to other kinds of, this is all based on prolonged stress, verbal abuse, being re-traumatized, like having, being Holocaust survivors and having Nazis march through your town. Um, treating people with contempt uh, and this is the last point, has to do with the marketplace of ideas, is not an idea, right? You know, that we've granted, we just, I feel like we have no sense of quality control when it comes to an idea. The, the marketplace of ideas is a romantic idea, but what, what, what Holmes didn't know, Justice Holmes didn't realize, is that it's simply not true that good ideas cancel out bad ideas. The truth is bad ideas never go away. And, and that's why for Federalist Society people who are big free market people, I know this is your thing, capitalism and free market, well, you know, then you should really look at this marketplace of ideas because it doesn't actually work like a free market. Because in a free market, if you're in the burger business and you make a shitty hamburger, you're out of business, right? Why are the Nazis still around? <laughs> Didn't? Didn't they have a shitty burger and it was, was totally rejected? There was like a whole world war, remember this? There was like a world war and then there was Nuremberg. After all that, we actually said, oh no, that's up, come on, come back into the marketplace. You know, it is a free exchange of ideas. That's not how markets work. We, we regulate markets too, right? And because we want to make sure, you know, that, we're, that the ideas are actually ideas and to the extent to which that they have true sense of meaning. Um, and that we're not, you know, we're afraid to recognize that there's a difference between, uh, you know, uh, th this idea of time, place, and manner, uh, content-based restrictions, also has something to do with manners. Um, that if you really don't have, if you ever got a problem with African Americans, you know, there's op-eds. There's things you can write if you're opposed to affirmative action. There are other ways to make your views known, but the hostility and the violence and the threat and the intimidation, that's what 
that's what certainly what my new book is about, is what I'm really talking about, that we have to be able to respect the idea that ideas are different from something that's truly intimidating, that something that causes nothing but harm, direct harm. All right, thank you. Thank you, panel. Um, I'm, Professor, I'm glad you, you uh, neurosciences ratified the way I felt when the New York Times and the Washington Post editorial boards criticized my opinion in Hobby Lobby. <laughs> I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna open this to, uh, for questions. I, I think um, we have a few minutes left and I'd like to get um, a lot of panel. Before, before I do that, I just, um, it, it feels to me as a, as a judge kind of looking upstream to the Supreme Court that um, over the last 10 years, really the Roberts Court uh, maybe will be or should be known as the golden age of the First Amendment, um, absolutism. And I was wondering if the panel might comment on whether they see this court, the Roberts Court, as particularly um, unique in the way it is approaching and defending um, and usually striking down um, restrictions on speech. I, ju I just want to say one brief thing about the Roberts court. It's Roberts himself. Snyder versus Phelps is just, and it's embarrassing. I mean, if you're really a morally righteous person, you know, again, he wrote it with a kind of smugness. Look at us, moral superiority. Look at us. It's a tutorial on what it means to be an American. But there's actually a sentence in there that he said, I wish he would just apologize for. It's just wrong. It's demonstrably wrong. He just said, he admits, he says, I know that what the Westboro Burt Church did caused hurt and pain. He says it caused pain to a grieving family, but pain is the price that they have to pay, that the family needs to pay in order to live in this democracy. I, I find for the Chief Justice of this, there's something so undignified that he wrote that with a kind of smugness that of course, doesn't that make us great? Instead, I wish, I wonder if his parents are embarrassed that he would actually write a sentence like that. The burden is on the people in pain to accept the pain because that's what it means to be an American. So to me, that sentence is unforgivable in an opinion, just utterly disgraceful. And again, it speaks to this, what I would say is a kind of smug moral superiority where we've just got, again, this panel's about going too far, that sentence goes too far. I'll just say one quick thing about Westboro Baptist case. Even if you agree that it was rightly decided, um, some grounds for criticism. So the court clearly thought that this was uh, uh, society going after an unpopular group. But here, here are two things. The, the, the Chief Justice, has, as Thane said, said things like, what, what does America mean yeah. without meaningful dialogue? So was the father supposed to say, oh, Pastor, stop for a minute. Let me, go t let me go engage in meaningful dialogue with the thank God for dead soldiers crowd. I mean, they're going to change their minds. Is this, we have to have a discussion about this. No, these, these, were, these are among the most closed-mind people in existence. If they need enlightenment, they can, they can yeah. get it has, themselves. It's has, not the Father's job to do. And here's one other point about Westboro Baptist. We always, the, these abs, the absolutist theme is always the individual right versus the faceless government trying to suppress speech. But guess what? In the Westboro Baptist case, it wasn't the government that did this. It was a jury verdict. It was a, it was a jury of peers applying the ancient common law doctrine of intentional infliction of emotional distress. Just Which the Supreme it's... Court essentially then disacknowledged and said, guess what, you're not, you were not subject to intentional distress. Right, they reversed uh, citizens, not, not the faceless government in that case. Steve? Um, sorry, I'll use this one. Uh, so I'll uh, raise my hand as the crazy free speech absolutist and say, uh, I think Snyder versus Phelps was definitely correctly decided. Um, now, there are ways to criticize the decision, but I don't think it's the fault of the Supreme Court, uh, of the Roberts Court. Um, I mean, there's, there's some question about what uh, the, the viability or uh, what, you know, how exactly do you construe um, uh, the tort of you know, intentional infliction of emotional distress. I don't find that easy. I haven't torn on that one. I don't know. But I mean, what I think Professor Rosenbaum is saying would apply whether it was a private tort or whether it was a government. Okay, so, and, and you can take aside the, I, 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 earlier I criticized, um, I wasn't speaking about Snyder 
in particular, but yes, there's a problem with the idea that people can just use the, the public streets to, to, to speak on, on anything. That is a problem. And because it creates these kinds of clashes. Although note that the, the father didn't learn about this, as I understand the facts. Uh, they were far away from the funeral. He saw it on television. So if we are to take, I think, what I understand Professor Rosenbaum to be saying, it would be appropriate for the government to pass a law that says you can't say those kinds of things on your own property, using your own money. Yes, even if they're crazy, but you're just not allowed to say them because they, what? I mean, you can use whatever terms you want. Hurt other people's feelings, make them outraged, rob them of their dignity. I would put that in scare quotes because it's not clear exactly what that means. Yes, those are horrible things. Yes, those guys are crackpots. They absolutely, absolutely have a right to say that so long as they're doing it with their own resources, right? They're not threatening somebody else, which they weren't. Uh, and, and I think the issue of public property is we could put that aside. You can't blame the Roberts court for inheriting, a, you know, what, several hundred year old tradition of having public property and mixing on um, the idea of private rights with public property. That's not John Roberts' fault. Um, but, uh, but this idea that, um, I mean, in a sense, I agree that, uh, that the issue comes down to, quote, harm, but you've got to define harm carefully. Harm is not, even if it's outrageous speech, I'm, I'm outraged and you said something that just cuts to the core of my being and what I really, really care about. That is an expression of ideas. I will, I'll, I'll demonstrate the principle quite easily. When Professor Rosenbaum was making fun of America, I was slightly ticked off about that, right? Now, it was, I think, in the kind of spirit of, of, of the talk, uh, but, but if it were a real, I think America is the worst country in the world, I would be pissed off about that. Why is that? Because I think America is good, i.e., I think the ideas it's based on is good. I think the traditions it's based on are, are good. Say the same thing to a communist, he will celebrate. What's the difference? His ideas are different from my ideas. Those are, a, that, that's an issue of an ex, the expression of ideas. Hate, dignity, all kinds of emotions, they, they flow from your ideas. If we say that you can protect somebody's emotions or their dignity, we are saying you can restrict their ideas. Um, yeah. so the, the only thing that makes a Phelps, Snyder versus Phelps case kind of difficult is that it is an IIED case. You may be interested to know as a little postscript that just a couple months ago in October of 2017, the Eighth Circuit decided a case called Phelps versus Ricketts. Uh, it's the daughter of the previous Phelps, and she's gone into the family business of insanity. And she, uh, <laughs> she was suing over a uh, time, place, manner restraint in Nebraska that, uh, that prohibited any protesting within 500 feet of a funeral uh, from one hour before the beginning of the ceremony till two hours after the beginning of the ceremony. And the Eighth Circuit unanimously upheld that as a valid uh, time, place, manner restraint. So one of the things that I think is interesting in comparing that case to the Snyder versus Phelps case at the Supreme Court is the private cause of action versus the public uh, time, place, manner. Let's take some questions. Um, particularly uh, with regards to hate speech. Um, are you at all concerned that maybe a more European style conception of free speech might actually um, have the opposite effect that you intend? Um, in certain countries like Germany, where I believe uh, a Holocaust denial is a crime, um, the ADP, which is a far right party, uh, recently got 15% of the vote or something close to that or um, even closer to America, um, when you had all the riots in Berkeley, when Milo Yiannopoulos showed up, he ended up um, getting a lot of pre-orders on his books. Or as I believe um, Professor McConnell noted, um, a lot of students have invited uh, speakers like Richard Spencer precisely because um, it kind of arouses um, anger from the authorities. Thank you. I just think you don't 
you don't not do the right thing because you're worried that you might lose a few people. I don't think that the rise of neo-Nazism in, in Germany has anything to do with the fact that the Germans in a post-war environment recognize that human dignity is something that they surely lacked when it came to uh, subhumans during the, during the Third Reich, and so they drafted a new constitution that took human dignity seriously. But the country still has an obligation to do the right thing, and you know I don't, I can't think of, even here the alt right movement is there because people in Berkeley were objecting to Richard Spencer. One 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 comment I want to get back to Steve is I'm not talking about being offended and insulted. I'm talking about harm, and so everyone keeps in conflating that. I started off with my own disclaimer. I said, look, I think the Muhammad cartoons are fair game. Harm is something else. And why is it, is, so, is it so hard in this room to look at the Snyder versus Phelps case and say, well, that's just outrageous, <laughs> that if you really are opposed to gays serving in the military, there's probably a lot of ways you can make that point. There's, we're not saying you can't make the point. There's many other ways than to take it to this family, whether they, were they, were, whether they experienced it at the moment or they found out about it later. And picking up on Joe's point a moment ago, in this marketplace of ideas, can anyone give me an example that after a cross burning, someone went off to talk to the Klan and changed their mind? Has it ever worked? Does that work, that you have this argument, public debate? The, Founders, the framers of our country were interested in the search for the truth, democratic deliberation, democratic participation. They were looking to civic duty. That's what the word public debate meant. Is that what you think? Is that, is that what Thomas Jefferson had in mind? Snyder versus Phelps? That was democratic participation? That was debate? That was the exchange of ideas? A skinhead on 60 Minutes a few weeks ago who did change his mind because of all the information he saw, all of what he could digest. And I think what's dangerous about your approach is you would allow government control of speech to turn on the difference between harm and offense. It's an impossible uh, distinction, and it would threaten a great body of speech. Uh, we, I, can I just respond to that? Yeah, you know, we a tolerate a lot of ambiguity in the bodily harm area all the time. Everyone here who's a lawyer knows, especially if you're a tort lawyer, that you go into negligence cases and they have an expert and they have an expert, and the jury hears two experts, and one expert says, he'll never run again, and the other person says, are you kidding? He'd run the Boston Marathon tomorrow. Right? And the guy's sitting there with a neck brace. And we tolerate all kinds of ambiguity. Here, oh, we couldn't possibly know that there's harm in the Snyder versus Phelps case or in the Skokie, Illinois case. I think that we can give people, the, the, we give jury the same level of latitude to have an objective, reasonable uh, criteria to say, yeah, that's harmful, especially when the neuroscience now demonstrates harm. So I was glad that Mr. Simpson came to the defense, but earlier, uh, toplessness in, in a variety of circumstances does convey a message. Uh, I represented the last nudist camp in Southern California, <laughs> not far from here in Topanga Canyon. And people went there to convey a message of freedom, of independence, of rejection of orthodoxy, of government control, uh, and this doesn't even reach topless dancing, which has uh, a message that's conveyed. So why would you so categorically uh, say it, it conveys no message? Is that um, how you know each other from the... <laughs> <laughs> I, knew, I knew I was going to regret bringing up the sex toys thing. Um, <laughs> so it's not that it doesn't convey anything. Actions have meaning and they do, so you've heard the expression actions speak louder than words, but it doesn't mean that actions are words. Now, I don't want to go off too much. My point is not people should not be able to be topless in certain contexts. It's that we have to make a distinction between speech as in, as in the spoken word, and we have to make a distinction between that and, and actions and other things that, that are just not, uh, you know, they're, they're not the spoken word, they're not conveying ideas. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be free to do those things, but I mean, context matters. 
But I mean, I do understand why people use the First Amendment for that. I'm not denigrating or criticizing lawyers who do that. If I were a lawyer, I would do the same thing. So I, I applaud you, but I think the, the I think our jurisprudence has gone gone off the rails a bit. Yep. Professor Rosenbaum, I enjoyed your uh, talk very much, and I agreed, I think, with most of it. But it seems to me that you were putting forth two principles, and it seems to me that those principles can clash in a way that you do not recognize, so I'd like to get a clarification. One of your principles is ideas uh, as opposed to other kinds of utterances uh, uh, without tightly defining that word, uh, the, with the idea that ideas should be protected and the others not necessarily. Uh, the second idea, the second distinction or principle is things that harm can be regulated and things that may just be offensive but don't really harm. Uh, now, I like both of those principles, but it does seem to me that ideas can hurt. I'm thinking of Ms. Widra's uh, presentation this morning, and it seems to me, let's say even forget DACA, uh, if you're having a discussion about uh, um, immigration, and somebody puts forth, in a very reasoned way, arguments for deporting a whole lot of immigrants who are in the country illegally. And if there's somebody else in the room whose parents are in that situation, I think that person could plausibly be very threatened and very hurt, and yet it's clear that the person who's speaking is presenting ideas. So, that's the, the place where it didn't seem to me that your remarks completely fit together, and I'd appreciate elaboration on it. Well, again, I think there's a difference between being hurt and there's a difference between damaged, harmed, and intimidated. Uh, putting forth a reasoned argument against immigration, even building a wall, just making the argument, which is why I think that what you see on college campuses is so ridiculous, because they're buying into the point that this gentleman is just saying, which is, the idea itself is so upsetting to me that I, I can't tolerate that. And I, I started off by saying, I don't agree with this. Ideas are open for debate. So if a person is making the legal, legal reasoned argument and someone feels hurt or insulted by it, that's different from actually being harmed, as opposed to you know, posting something on their door that says, get out of our country, towelhead. Right? That, to me, is not an idea, and it's certainly not packaged in an appropriately uh, civilized way, intellectual way, that res respects a person's citizenship, their sense of human dignity, their sense of social standing. Yeah, I'm with you on all of that, right. but um, am I just understanding? Which is correctly? why the song of the lynching song by, by that fraternity in Oklahoma, I think it's perfectly appropriate to take action against that. That's different. They're not making an argument about affirmative action. They're not saying, let me tell you what's wrong with affirmative action. And they write an article in the local newspaper. They're saying, I think we should lynch black people. So am I understanding you correctly then? The ideas principle is sort of the first principle. Yes. Because you're defining harm as not some state of mind that's caused by uh, the expression of ideas, uh, so that in a sense, that's the primary principle and then the harm principle comes next. Let me just say one this last thing. If I was a neuroscientist, sir, this is what I would say. When I take PET scans or MRI scans of human brains, and I show I, the human brain that you described for that first person when you described the reasoned argument in somebody's parents, they would say there's almost no activity there. That's different from what you do when you threaten and intimidate. And you put people in that kind of position of prolonged stress and that sense of being treated with that level of contempt. And he would say to you, or she would say, if I show you two brain scans, the one that you're describing shows no activity. This one is getting brain damage. versus freedom of expression. And that brings to mind uh, the case of Island Tree School District versus Pico, where the court in a plurality talks about removing school books from a library, and it refers to the right to receive ideas. And I take it 
that, and I probably would agree, that that's a rather problematic way of thinking about it, because if taken to its logical extreme, that would seem to eradicate privacy, for example, if I have a right to receive ideas. But is it possible to have freedom of speech without a right to receive ideas? I mean, it seems like we're surrounded by so many instances in which it would be easy, in the absence of a right to receive ideas, for the government to restrict our access to ideas and then step back and say, but we didn't take your rights away, in the same sort of gamesmanship that it uses with, for example, regulatory takings. Oh, well, we didn't take your land. We just deprived you of your right to use it, so we don't give you any compensation. It'd be the same kind of thing in free speech. Well, we didn't take away your right to speak. We just took away every book you have possible access to, and therefore we haven't violated the First Amendment. Is that really coherent to the two of you? Um, no, I agree with you, Tim. I, I think uh, there has to be, um, uh, I mean, I would call it a derivative right. There's the right to speak, and then there's the right of other people to, to, to listen. Um, that is, in a sense, if you only have one person, there's really no, you know, there's only a speaker and not a listener, so there's no... No, the, the issue doesn't come up, so I think speech is the primary. But, but yes, definitely there has to be a right to, to listen, to receive ideas. But it's, again, my, my big beef is with the idea that the government is the one providing all of this stuff and considering that to be the right. If I said that, that uh, uh, if I implied that somehow uh, what you just articulated, that I disagree with it, then I, I was making a mistake. I definitely think you have the right to, you have to have the right to purchase books, you have to have the right to access information, but it has to be uh, on a voluntary basis. Other people are providing that voluntarily and engaging with you voluntarily. Not the, the notion that there's a right to just information provided by the government, because that's coming from somebody else, and that's ne necessary. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't think you can answer that question because because what do you do about the taxpayers who are really really angry that their money is going to fund it? I don't have an answer to that. I take your point. I'm not in favor of taking books out of libraries, but you know, I don't think that can be solved given public education. Yeah, and I, I just briefly, uh, I would say that there is, I think, a difference between a person's right to listen to someone saying their piece on the one hand and to compelling production of information from the government on another, or what is really terrifying, and I actually think this was uh, well, an exact quote from my co-panelist uh, about quality control by the government, that you know that's the same concept that the First Amendment includes, you know, this is this language from a Globe newspaper uh, where it says that uh, it, the constitutionally protected discussion, it will ensure that the constitutionally protected discussion of governmental affairs is an informed one. Where does that end? Who's doing this quality control? Do we need to shut down CNN because they're you know, harming the quality of our national discourse? <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> kidding, that was a joke. Uh, <laughs> But I think, I think we can safely draw some lines around affirmative obligations on the one hand versus the ability to, to hear from people on the other. Yeah, back. Yes, in the back. Uh, my question for all of you briefly is, how much do you think this is a problem within the First Amendment field itself? I'm a First Amendment attorney, and I find that a lot of the time as attorneys, we love to talk about this in theory, but we have a very hard time having a conversation using our own talking points. Um, I think we keep ourselves in a safe space in our lot and talk to our own circles way too much. So how much do you think is more of this is a cultural problem more so than a legal problem in that isn't it a lot easier just to defend the absolutism because it's uncomfortable for many of us to actually have the real conversation about the Nazis marching in 2017, where it was a lot easier to defend that in theory because it happened in the past and we don't have to deal with it anymore. Let's take that. Nope. Um, I'll just say quickly that I, I think it's almost primarily a legal problem in the sense that I think if you told most Americans about all these rights that exist under the First Amendment, uh, you have a right to be homeless in the library under the First Amendment. I think they would they would not agree with it. And I, I think to quote Justice Jackson, he he did say that no no right is made more secure by making it ridiculous and obnoxious. We're seeing that a little bit on the campuses. I mean, I think that there is an 
not absolute, almost absolute right to engage in political speech. It's, uh, it's, it's a worrisome trend to see students um, come to deplore the principle because they think it uh, allows bad things. But no, I, I think it's, it's, it's really like a doctrinal problem, not a cultural problem. There's, a, there's a, just a great chasm between the two. I think we have time for one more up in the back. Thank you. Uh, is there any hesitation in using the existing legal framework we have in order to uh, protect, um, to fight back against these ideas? So for instance, I'm thinking uh, you have Szaplinski versus New Hampshire, which says fighting words are uh, not protected by the Constitution. In that case, it was talking about damned fascists. Now, in Charlottesville, that was quite a literal instance where people's words were causing people to fight. In another instance, um, with the viewing executions in Arizona, um, I know there are cases that say that public records, you have no First Amendment right to access to public records. Is there any hesitation by advocates or judges in applying those cases uh, as the Supreme Court has pushed the boundaries of uh, free speech absolutism? Yeah, um, boy, that's a good question. So uh, if I understand correctly what you're asking, uh, some of our doctrinal, uh, it's sort of easy to acknowledge fighting words in the New Hampshire case. And then taking that further and further and trying to gauge exactly how far from instigating actual violence you need to be before it's triggered is the stuff that makes you know all of us employed. And that's, that's sort of a, uh, you know, doctrinally it's easy enough to state, but I do think there is some degree of hesitation and probably appropriately in, in some instances. In the execution context, um, it's a difference between proceedings, because until the Ninth Circuit and California First Amendment Coalition, we're just talking about obtaining things that were filed in court. Those are all cases about testimony being sealed and unsealed, and uh, it's that type of access to information. And now uh, we're talking about a different level of information, which is not pleadings and procedure, but rather affirmative demands about uh, the government conducting its business outside of the judicial uh, context, the core judicial context. So uh, as, with, as with many things in the law, I suspect it's a difference of degree maybe, uh, but, but at some point, uh, you know, again, I, I think we've crossed a difference of kind line in that context of the, of the right to information under the First Amendment. Uh, thank you very much, and help me uh, thank the panel for today's presentation. <laughs>have uh, one quick <laughs> housekeeping announcement. Um, once again, I'm Lisa Yizel from the Federalist Society. Um, we have about an hour break before the reception um, tonight, so uh, you have some time to tour the library. Uh, you need to have your name tag and this yellow sticker to enter into the library, so please bring that. If you need a sticker, just stop at the registration desk and we can give you an extra one. Um, you can take a self-guided tour until about 4.30 and the reception will begin um, there on the second floor in the Air Force One Overlook. And we'll have some volunteers to help guide your way if you get lost. Um, once again, I just want to thank all of our Western chapter leaders for their hard work putting on this conference. I also want to thank my colleagues, um, particularly Kate Fugate, who worked very hard um, on all the logistics for this event today.